All right. So, so we're not doing a PR today. That the topic, I couldn't rally the troops. So for the one I wanted to do. So we're substituting. This is actually something I've been interested in doing, um, with Blab because PR is not moving to Blab. Sorry, people, it's not happening. <laughs> there just aren't enough seats. Look at this. We we have one open seat for now, but um, we just. Yeah, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, direct to YouTube, all kinds of things. But I thought that hopefully in the near future, when maybe I myself have a more built out podcast studio, we're going to talk about that, right? Um, that maybe on the off weeks, this would be a good fill in. And I mean, this one's already gone too far down the PR path where it's there's a topic. I mean, I guess you need a topic, but uh, maybe it'll be a little more, we could bring more people in and out would be a good thing. So you know, maybe we can do PR on both platforms. How would that be? Throw it on the wall, see what happens. Exactly, exactly. Throw it on the wall. We experiment here. So anyways, I don't have a whole lot of time, but we got, man, we got a lot of people chilling right now. 26, what's up, everybody? Robert, Chris, Douglas, Jeremy, Jim, Paul. All right, love it. Um, I'm curious about podcast dudes. If you know, uh, if you follow me, if actually, what I'm going to do, I'm building a podcast studio, building a podcast studio. I'm converting an old garage into my office slash podcast studio space. And um, that process is going right now. It's finally going. Dave's been asking me, when's that going to start? Uh, it's finally starting. We've poured in the cement floor. I wish I could show you pictures here. I could do that on Google Plus. I can't, or on, on Hangouts. I don't think I can do it on Blab. Uh, of course, yes, if I did Cam Twist and all that, blah, blah, blah. Natively, natively. But uh, having the cement poured in, where? Because doesn't the garage already have cement? Yes, it had a cement floor. It uh, this thing was built in 1936. Uh, it was uneven, very cracked. It was a, it was pretty much a mess. So uh, I and it was not level with basically the rest of the house. It's not underneath like where the. It's not like I'm putting it where water's gonna be an issue. It's just that over the years, since 1936, they've poured up concrete like the driveway, so it's not even. So this gives me a clean slate. It's really nice. Yeah, it's it, it's a costly part of the of the build, but um, it's nice. It's in. So yes, it's cement over cement, um, but now it's beautiful. And so I think what I'm gonna do because I am trying to document it as much as possible. So. Uh, and I'm like, where am I going to put that uh, where, where I could show it? Anyways, patreon.com slash Ray. Yes, that's a paid platform, but I'm going to put it in the public feed. So you won't have to sign up to Patreon to see it. It'll just be there. I haven't put anything yet. So go over to patreon.com slash Ray, and I'm going to post them there as posts as I create the updates, pictures, uh, stuff like that. It'll let me do that pretty easily. So Another cool thing about Patreon, right? It doesn't, you don't have to put it behind the paywall. So I think that's really cool. Probably a different topic. So anyways, I'm building that out. I work from home. It'll be an office, but I'm curious about that. Daniel, you are looking for a new place or you have a new place for your studio. Dave, you are not at home right now. You're in your studio. So why don't you guys talk about why, why you need to be out of the house for your podcast studio when you're, when you, when you decided to build your studio. Now let me, let me say, I said build in the, it's a little more link baity because like, ooh, build a podcast studio. But sometimes it might just be craft, right? What what do you put together for your studio? Mixer, it could be gear, it could be on your desktop. But you guys both chose to leave the house. Why? In my case, and this is a recent decision, and it's not necessarily a permanent decision. I am in a rented uh, commercial space here. And that was because... Uh, couple of reasons. One is we're trying to sell our house right now so that we can move into something that fits better, that can have my own studio on our property potentially. And in that process of trying to sell the house, I hated having to take down my lighting equipment, my video studio area and put it back up. And I just, I wasn't getting to record videos because of that hassle of, I knew I'm just going to have to take this down again in a couple of days for a showing. And also uh, the noise was a factor, not necessarily a lot of noise we don't have kids yet but uh just having to ask my wife basically don't move don't breathe for the next hour i'm going to be recording a video without doors in the take a room. nap yeah unless yeah. you snore and the take. sound really travels in the house where we are and my environment was nice and quiet actually quieter than my environment here but it meant having to 
put everyone under lock and key in order to get the house quiet. So having this extra external space now gives me the freedom to set my stuff up, leave it set up, and be able to record without inconveniencing my wife or someday future family. Blab note, my camera might not actually be blurry. I might have just had the browser too big. Is my camera blurry to you guys? I don't think it is. No. Yeah. So if you, I mean, it doesn't take, uh, the resolution of Blab is not, you know what I mean? That little square, because you can resize the browser and it'll go with it. And if it gets bigger, eh, anyways, just something I noticed. Let me make it smaller here. I think most people see it in a smaller format anyway, especially if you're on mobile. But anyways, Daniel, so um, compromise there. You decided it, it's, you know, quiet is an important factor for a podcast studio when you're building one, right? I'm I'm taking, I'm going to try to take precautions uh, to to shore up sound. I'm using this stuff called quiet rock. It's just really basically eight times the density of regular sheet rock. I'll seal up all the holes, but I'm doing some things like putting in big giant French doors that are have big glass plates in them, not conducive to to sound. I just told you I poured a cement floor. Of course, I'll put some carpeting over that. Uh, but certain things that I'm choosing for a podcast to do that aren't necessarily conducive to recording. So you made a compromise. You said it's not as quiet, but obviously that was less important, or you could deal with that. Well, how was that decision? Um, part of it I didn't discover until I moved into this space to learn that, well, my neighbors are kind of noisy, but uh, not all that often, but sometimes, yes, and I can't control the sound here at all, but it's a more manageable level of noise. So it's like I have a constant noise of traffic coming in through the window. I'm really close to an interstate, but I can close a door beyond in one of the other rooms here and it's less noticeable. But then the building just has this low frequency hum to it that I think is maybe vibration coming from a vending machine on a different floor, or maybe it's something else about the building. Huh. You know? But And that makes it into lav mic recordings for videos. Mm. So it's not as clean of a recording, but the thing is, it's a lot more convenient for me to record here. I can leave my stuff up, I can leave my equipment out, and I can record really pretty much whenever I want. And that's a huge freedom and a freedom that I need to be able to do the recording I want to do. Yeah. You mentioned something that, would, oh, uh, I, I did my first, I, the cement floor was, was poured. It's just, uh, studs now, right? Just the studs. And it, there's an old garage, but it's open. And, uh, I went and recorded as big giant carriage doors that open. I went to the sort of back of the studio. It's about 250 square feet. It seems to get smaller every time I measure it. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but um, yeah, it's under 250 square feet, but I recorded, I just broke out like the, cause I actually was talking and I know I was like, whoa, there's this weird, crazy bass buildup uh, that just like, that can happen. Like I am hoping that when I shore things up, it's not as bad as it is. I'm definitely gonna probably have to put in some bass traps, which I wasn't planning on doing, but holy cow, I broke out the phone just to record. And I mean, it does this thing like it hum, it takes on a life of its own. It sort of just builds upon itself. Whole, holy terrible. So Dave, why, uh, why did you leave or why did you have your own space that's separate from your house? Uh, the biggest one is I had a really hard time. This is uh, back when I forget exactly how long ago I moved. It's been a while because uh, I've had two different offices. I moved to one and then I moved to the, this new one. Um, but I kept going in to check my email just for a minute and coming out about an hour and a half later. And about the 80 millionth time I did that, my wife said, we need to have a chat because I kept ruining family night because I would, she goes, I, I didn't really marry you to look at the back of your head. And um, I went, you know, you got a point. And so, um, yeah, so I basically got that and cut back my, uh, I, it, originally I didn't think I was going to be able to do it because at the time I was just podcasting all the time. And so she said, why don't you take like two nights a week? And so we set that up and I just basically use tools like Asana and other things so that when I get here on Monday and Thursday, I am good to go. And I basically just bust through everything and uh, I'm more focused that way. And I do like the fact I'm actually in a basement of a building, which I didn't think at the time about it, but I like it because it's quieter. I'm, I'm kind of isolated from outside noise. So, um, but that was my big reason. I just needed to, I had a problem separating work from home. I don't think I would have that problem now. Um, I'm actually pondering moving back. I might actually move um, back into my apartment 
Um, but that was the original region. And uh, ori originally thought I was going to be able to do it because I was just completely disorganized, just throwing, doing stuff whenever I could. And it really forced me to get organized and figure out when and where and what I was doing. Let me just say that this will definitely be a podcasters roundtable. I mean, we have so much experience just between the three of us and we'll bring other people. So go to podcastersroundtable.com. Sign up over there on the list so you can be notified. We'll, we'll probably do this one soon. Or maybe we'll wait a little bit until I get a little further in the process. But anyways, I, and I said, so someone, let's see, we got Oliver who asked a question and I clicked on it and I think everyone can see it there, right? That's cool. Commute time to the studio. So for me, it's detached garage right out that door if you're watching this. Uh, zero, you know, 15 seconds unless I stop by the fridge and then it's like 25 seconds. But Daniel, how far is your studio from your house? It's about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. which as much as I don't like having a commute again and all of the complications that come along with that, like now we're driving a car again, now maybe we need to keep the second car that we've been trying mm -hmm. to sell and gas and food that I have to bring. And But what I do like about it is it's now a mental shift time that I can shift from work mode to home mode. And it also gives me more time to listen to podcasts. Yeah. And I mean, it is an issue. It's not a non-issue because even like today we were talking, we're going to do a PR and then I canceled it late and well, there's someone at my studio door, <laughs> I guess. Oh shoot. I think I'm selling something on Craigslist. They're too early. Anyways, you guys keep going Be back. All right. Um, How's your commute, Dave? My commute is uh, about 10 minutes. Um, 20 if I walk. Um, it depends. I have a couple traffic lights between, but it's probably two, four, like 10 blocks, if that. Um, and I, it's, um, I'm right in front of a target. So there's a lot of traffic, uh, you know, during the, as the holidays are picking up, it's getting more and more, uh, traffic and things like that. So, but, um, it's not bad and I, I'm with you. It is, it is a different, when I get here, I'm in a different mental state. It's like, okay, let's turn off Netflix. Let's turn off YouTube. And I just open it up and all right, here's, you know, what I'm going to do and go to town and it sounds weird. It feels more like a business now as opposed yeah. to a hobby. Yeah. The same thing for me because I come in, you know, I have to be fully clothed. I can't come to work <laughs> with my robe anymore with other clothing. Don't worry. Don't freak out. Don't do anything else with that thought. But uh, so I, I come here and recognize this is totally business space. It's not business and pleasure. It's totally business and has lots of business expenses with it. But um, it's kind of nice having it separate, completely separate like that. But I kind of think about what is the lifestyle I actually want to have with my business. And maybe that is that I actually want my studio on my property, but not a room in my house, maybe connected or detached. Like I love the idea of converting the detached garage. Hooray. And we're looking for options like that in our area. And we got uh, Christopher Nessie. So I love this question thing where I can just pull up the, so, you know, man, we have to make PR both platforms. I, I there's, there's just multiple reasons. Anyways, these are cool. I really love this. It wasn't here. I don't remember this last time. I don't do enough blapping, but uh, can you guys share some, some pictures of your spaces? So again, I'm going to document the whole thing. Patreon.com slash Ray. It'll be free. You can watch it in the public feed. Uh, I don't know. You guys might want to post some pictures somewhere or do you have pictures, Dave, of your setup? Not re it's it's a big rectangle room. My desk is at the end of it, um, and from here to the door, there is a sea of about nine guitars. Nice, a mini fridge, um, a bunch of books on the floor that I threw in here today, and I now have a total gym. So it's just, I mean, I can you know, it's I know it's an audio podcast, but you know, this is there's the big square room, there's the guitars, there's the a bunch of bookcases, there's my coat. And then it's just me sitting at a desk. There's, there's my messy desk, I should say, with with one big giant monitor over here and another one there. And then here's my lighting kits uh, over there. And uh, that's it. Is there's not much. And then behind me is my mixer and my lovely diploma. Um, but there's not much to it. It's just a big room with. Uh, I've always told people, Dave, get on mic. Um, I've always told people it's basically a, a bedroom without a bed in another building. It's not. You know, I don't. I don't have people coming over to look at stuff. So it's just me. 
Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, I'm in my dining room. I got I got a paper cut out card castle back here. I mean, I'm, I'm in my dining room. This is one of the reasons I'm. Well, you know, we moved into this house when we moved. Uh, we moved. We moved to this house. It's like 950 square feet, uh, but it's on like 5,000 square foot lot. So it's got a lot of space. But the house is small, and one of the things there was that detached garage, as Daniel mentioned, and. And one of the selling points, my wife, she's like, well, you could turn that into an office. I was like, I'm holding you to that. Like, <laughs> I am going to do that because let's face it, it's also a great excuse for a nice little man cave, but uh, it's an office. It's an office. It's serious business now because I work from home. Um, and a lot of things I can't do after hours because literally my daughter's sleeping in like the, the wall next next door. You know, I can't do like a live uh, round table or, you know, they come in from uh, work and stuff like that. So um, it needs its space. I will say that yesterday, very exciting. They dropped fiber to my house. So I will have fiber and that's just luck of the draw, right? I didn't move Christmas here because I knew there's July or whatever. Christmas in November. <laughs> November <dude>. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's, I am very thankful on this Thanksgiving month of having fiber, but, um, you know, I'm as, I mean, on that, yep. um, as my wife and I are searching for new houses for every house we're interested in, we check the local fiber optics company to see if that address has fiber. And if it doesn't, we don't look at that house. <laughs> wow. So you're requiring fiber? Like, because cable, fast cable, I have cable now. It's really fast, totally plenty. I mean, the cable is fine. Well, our fastest cable connection currently, and I know they might change this someday in the future, but currently it's 50 down, five up. And what matters most to me is that upload, really, because I'm uploading HD videos and I have someone else edit my videos. So the longer it takes for the videos to upload, the longer it takes to put out products or videos and such. Like SEO for podcasters, when I recorded that, that was 12 hours or so at least of recorded video. It took a week to upload all of that HD video. Um, so uh, cable though, or fiber optic connection out here is one gig down, 250 meg up. Yeah, now I will say it's not gigabit. I have 100, it'll be 100 down, 100 up, but that's way more, I mean plenty i mean it's crazy on my cable i think i pay for like 50 or something i mean i i've i've commonly seen it clock at like 124 things i've never seen before but cable i guess it does get congested right everyone comes home and i do see that slow down fiber is supposed to be no sharing right me 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 so we'll see but that's exciting uh but yeah i mean at least five i would say good speed internet for at least us, would be a very important factor for a podcast studio, right? Um, live is becoming such a part of podcasting. I, I don't want to say that like it's a, like a blanket statement, but it really is coming into play with Blab and Hangouts. Um, Blab is, is, a, is a really good example because pretty soon, I mean, depending on what they do with PodClear, and I think it could be the platform to record your show on with co-hosts. We'll see in the future, maybe even right now. I mean, you get decent quality out of it. So I think live could become, you know, very big. So bandwidth is, is an issue. I mean, even if you're just doing Skype, right? Skype interviews. So it's important. Fortunately, more and more places through at least the U S it's getting, you know, decently easy to find decent speeds, but there's plenty that don't have it. So what, what do you guys, you know, Sound. I'm trying to think of the big factors. So here I am putting this studio together. I'm punching a big hole in the side of the wall. That's not good for sound. <laughs> I'm putting glass in. Not good for sound. These are French doors. I, now, part of me is I have a, an Apple aesthetic. I like design. So I, part of it is for me. Like I want that natural daylight. I want the sun to come in. I love sitting in the sun that warms you, but it's not too hot. I really love that. So it'll look pretty too because that's where I spend so much of my time. So, you know, you compromise on some things like putting glass in the side. But, you know, I, I didn't go with the, the laminated glass, which would help, would knock down by like 5 dB. There's a lot of decisions I'm making that you won't know until the space is built and you go, ah, yeah, should have got that done. Like, like Daniel said, you, you didn't really know about some of the sound issues till you moved into it and then you got to deal with it, right? Right. Yeah. And are you dealing with sound from the outside or reverb on the inside? Like, what do you see is your major problem that you're dealing with? The reverb on the inside, I have no clue how it's going to go, right? I mean, I won't know until the drywall, until the room is up. Now, outside, we have, you know, small aircraft uh, occasionally. I the, the detached garage is set back from the house. It's basically in the, where the area of the backyards are, 
fortunately not a lot of noise back there. So I think doing some minimal things like the quiet rock and making sure everything's sealed, I think that'll be plenty good for a podcast studio. There may still be moments where you just have to stop while the freaking gardener team, you know, I mean, I'm not going to beat leaf blowers and weed whackers. I'm, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> right. So that comes into play, right? You would need something else um, if that was primary. And that could be a concern. At some point, I may want to bring people in the studio that could be paying for time. And we, I don't want to say, hey, we need to pause. In that case, you know, I won't, I won't lie. I have dreams of moving a studio to a, a more centrally located space. But that is, they're literally dreams. We shall see. Dave. Well, what about air conditioning? Uh, yes. So it's only less than 250 square feet. So one really small wall unit is going to take the power of that. And you see these mini split systems. They're not cheap, but they're super, super quiet um, to the point where you could run them when you're recording, most likely. Again, I won't know until I get in there. Uh, I've even gone so far as, I, I think it's going to be discontinued with this one. It looks like a big giant picture frame glass and you put a picture in it, but it's actually the air conditioning unit because I hate those big giant wall warts. They're so ugly to me and I record video in the space. So aesthetics, again, are important to me personally, right? A lot of that will sound lame to some people, but it's important to me. So that's how I'm going to heat and cool. It's one unit that heats and cools uh, a very small space. I'm thinking of doing an underground sort of thing. Like our latest idea, I've gone around with different ideas, but you're talking about like you need special insulation, you need special sheetrock to insulate yourself from sound outside. Then you have to deal with re reverb once you're inside. Yeah. And that presents new complications. What I'm thinking is the ideal for me in this space is we're thinking of buying a house where the seemingly state mandated by level home in the Midwest area, but it might be what we need buying a house and building an extra basement onto the back of the garage. So there would be no wall that connects with a, uh, an occupied space in the home and it would be solid concrete around buried mostly underground. And then what I'm thinking is to put up the studs around the side and put up insulation and then nothing else other than sheets, uh, not sheets, but fabric, like speaker fabric in front of the insulation. So it would look nice, but then the walls would be like solid uh, uh, acoustic panels, essentially. I'm going to try to avoid putting, I mean, you're kind of doing We lost your audio, Ray. You have to unmute the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was saying you're sort of putting up acoustic paneling without showing that you're putting up acoustic right. paneling, which, you know, I don't really want to put up acoustic panels, but I may, I mean, based off that, what I walked in there the other day, holy cow, I probably will have to put up something. So again, it's a, we'll see. I definitely have to deal with it in some way, whether that's the way you fill it, right? With furniture, bookshelves to create different angles and not just a flat box, carpet, um, you know, I've even seen cool acoustic panels that are sort of hung down from the ceiling. You could build these yourself. They're sort of like, uh, clouds, uh, that I called sound. Uh, I won't say sound. They're not called sound clouds. <laughs> That's completely different, but it's like a little floating acoustic panel. So it helps with the ceiling without sort of just blanketing the ceiling. So yeah, it should be interesting. I mean, it'll definitely be interesting to find out, uh, what other factors, if you're looking for a podcast space, I will say video is another factor for me. I shoot video. It's a very important element of what I do, not necessarily as a podcast, but on YouTube. So that's going to be, it's a little bit more of a challenge in a smaller space, depending on what you're going for. So what are the other important factors for you guys when you're picking out a podcast studio? Yeah, the, the look of it is important right now. In I just uh, glued these things up. These are just cheap pads from like the 1970s. They look horrible, but they do help with the reverb. And I owned them already. Someone was throwing them away. If you can't tell they look like they should be thrown away. And they work without having to build acoustic panels, which I'll probably build at some point. But it doesn't look nice at all. I think some acoustic panels or even just spray painting these things black or gray would look a lot nicer. The thing that I'd really love to have with a video uh, background is depth so I can get some nice depth yeah. of field. And that's the challenge I'm talking about in a smaller space for me because I do shoot a, you know, it's sort of a style. And 
you know, you can accomplish that in a relatively small space. It's just, it takes, takes some work um, and some decent cameras. I was going to say, you're not going to do that with a C920. <laughs> no, you're not going to do I mean, I do, I'm, uh, look, what's behind me is very far, is relatively very far behind me. You can see back here, uh, mm -hmm. I can't get to it. That's sort of blurry. But that's it, man. That's the shadow that the field you're going to get on the C920 because it's a tiny sensor. It's not going to be able to give you that shallow depth of field and aperture comes into play. But um, yeah, I mean, we are chatting here about building a studio. I mean, people are saying unless you're recording commercially or paying clients, uh, you don't have to, you don't need too much good mics and good processing go a long way. And I, I agree with that. This isn't about like uh, getting good sound necessary. I mean, this isn't the production of the show that's so much as like, your space. And if your space, I mean, look at all of us. Daniel's got some makeshift stuff going on. I'm in my dining room and Dave just said he's in a bedroom without a bed. So, and we produce great podcasts. So yeah, don't mistake what we're talking about for, uh, for saying that any of this is needed. We're not doing it currently. So, <laughs> well, Daniel a little bit, but he's in transition. So that's how it goes. Well, and especially here's the reason I'm moving. Here we go. Chaos is about to rain. <laughs> when you go up. in uh, uh when we talk about the background you got to realize again if you're doing a video that later turns into an audio podcast 90 right. percent of the audience is never going to see your background they're just going to listen to it doesn't matter yeah yep so you no know, christopher asked an interesting question for those for dave and i i guess or anyone else who has an off-site studio he said is it often that you get back home and think of something you could have said or added to a recent recording and either went back or just said, eh, forget it. I, it's, it's again, it's, I shift my mindset. When I lock the door on my office and I'm walking up the stairs, it's my pledge to my family to be in family mode. So I, I just put it back and, you know, there are times when I've forgotten stuff. I'm like, where's my iPad? It's at my office. And I'm like, you know what? It's home time. I'll, deal with it or whatever so daniel what about you for me if there's something like that that happens um most of the time i'll think of it right after i've recorded and think nah, yeah I, I should have i should redo for me if i'm going to fix something usually i end up redoing an entire episode or it's something i remember right after we finish like a little announcement i need to record and then have edited into the episode but most of the time if it, I'm not even thinking about the podcast. After I finished recording an episode, I now uh, changed my schedule so I didn't have to stress about, oh, I need to make sure this is published before I go back home or before tonight, before dinner or anything like that. And uh, so I finish on Monday, upload it so my editor can have it. Then Tuesday morning, I come in, publish it then. And I, I don't kind of care if there was something I forgot it probably wasn't important because yeah, I didn't I, my show notes. I, I've I've caught things days later. I know I did a thing about learn to podcast dot com and I was explaining about it. And then at the very end of it, I said, "So if you want to check it out, just go to or uh, learn to subscribe dot com." Is what I was talking about. And at the very last time I said the domain, I went learn to podcast dot com, and I'm like, "That's the wrong website. Uh, I don't even own that one." So. And it was one of those where I'm like, am I going to go back and fix that one line? I'm like, no, because I said it right the first two times. And I think most people knew what I was talking about. If not, it's a free website. So, Yeah, we all make silly slip-ups like that. Yeah. Hey, I promised this one a bike ride. So you got a new bike with training wheels. So we're going to do that before it gets dark. I don't. If I leave, do you guys? can you guys keep going? Make us, make one of us a host. I will. Click on the name. You know okay. how to do that. I think so. Click on your name. Let's do this. You say hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Here, here come the mad props for Ray and his. I, this is how you get claps on Blab. I just as soon as she sat down, I was like, "That's how you get claps." That's it. I don't know what happened. I I checked you. Is that? Are you now a host? Yeah. Um, no, I unchecked you. That's a follow. Yeah. So click on my name, and then there's a a. a I got G you. Button. Host. I got it. There we go. And I think you're host. It, yeah, he, it's weird because he will only show the H if he refreshes. Oh, uh, well, that, will that matter in terms of? You've been made a co-host. Oh, I lost my powers. I, I put it back. Okay. It's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. I Hopefully when I leave, that'll work yeah. for you guys. Yeah. All right, you guys. See you. Right, we'll see you. That was fun. We'll, we'll do this on the round table. Podcastroundtable.com. 
Yeah, I'm in this uh, this place where I I don't really know what would be the 100% ideal studio for me. And that idea of 100% ideal has changed over the, the years or yeah, the years that we've been thinking of doing something externally. Like it went from let's find a house that has a bedroom that I can convert into a studio to uh, let's find a place that has space in the backyard that I can change uh, or build something. Now it's let's build something practically underground as a studio. <laughs> onto the back of the house and that might be it i mean anything that i'm thinking about i know we're talking twenty thousand dollars um that i'm i'm hoping we can then like finance in some way and then uh, it would take about a year probably to get all built and i try and do as much of it myself to save money yeah yeah it's weird for me i want a bunch of space around my desk for for lighting rigs and you know, um, outlets are a whole nother. When I moved into this, uh, studio, I, I still am by fighting a, uh, some sort of ground loop hiss air kind of whiny thing that drives me crazy. That's one of the things I want to troubleshoot this weekend. So that might be something if you look into it in terms of, uh, you know, how old is it? What well, is, is that? The ground this is what you need. All right. Ground loop isolator. The noise you had is exactly the same noise I was getting. In fact, I can unplug some things here and create that noise. But that... That's it. Yeah. That's a ground loop noise. I thought ground loop noises only came in lower frequencies. Okay. So when someone said, you might have a ground loop thing, I was thinking, no, 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 it couldn't be that because it didn't sound like ground loop until I tried a ground loop isolator and that fixed the problem. And for me, it's really bad. And it's no different actually here in this studio than back at home. It really started when I got my new Mac. Uh, something about this new Mac, I think is a little bit more susceptible to ground loop isolation, or maybe it's the hub that I bought that goes along with this Mac, whatever the case, it's just gotten worse in this new studio because I added an extra piece of equipment that imagine spaghetti in audio cable form yeah. And that's the thing. Like everything here, it's like equipment incest here. Everything is connected to everything else through at least two connections. And that's just the recipe for a ground loop problem. Yeah, it's for me, I've I I know what it is. The minute I plug in my Griffin iMic and it goes back to the mixer, you know, so which makes sense. I mean, that's that's completing the loop or whatever, but it's like, okay, and it's not the Griffin I mic. I actually switched it out with something else, and it's it's yeah. just it's something weird. But it might be the monitor. Even think about that. That is one thing that's changed is I got a bigger monitor, and it might just be something with that. But uh, um, I'm not sure. It's, uh, Linda had asked, what about – what's the, the best square footage? I'm not that – you guys are in – it's been so long since I've, like, looked at apartments and houses. I, I have no idea what my square footage is here. I just know I like having extra space around me. And in, in the past, I had a little square office and really was everything was squished and I had no room for lights. And uh, especially if I want to hang stuff behind me, it's kind of weird when you have to climb on the desk to get around stuff. So I like having a little extra room, which then looks like you're wasting space because you, you walk in and there's this desk sitting in the middle of nowhere with all these things around it. So do you know the dimensions of your room? You know, I should. And I honestly, I have no idea. It's it's just a big rectangle. I'm going to guess you're somewhere around 250 square feet, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's definitely 300. 20 feet by uh, something. Yeah. I'm in um, 12 by 26, so 312 square feet. And that's, I think that's about ideal for me. I don't necessarily like to my right is this wall that separates me from the other office. I don't necessarily like having this space um, separated by a wall, but uh, as it is, but because I have a window uh, to my left with the Interstate 75 out there and that traffic noise, when I record video, I'm using a different microphone, a lav microphone, which does pick up that noise. This microphone, uh, even if I turn off my compressor limiter gate and I was recording this in high quality sound, you would not hear the traffic noise outside because the dynamic microphone isn't picking it up. I'm close enough to it. But uh, the lav mic does. So I set up my video studio in the other room. So that wall is actually nice to have because it gives me an extra separation from the window. But then I have 
hallway noise. So I think for me, about 300 square feet is ideal. In what shape? I think most likely probably a rectangle more than a square would be more ideal for me. So I could have my audio station on one side of the room and my video station on the other side of the room. And like all of the stuff that we're talking about, it's because we are professionals who need to do a lot of things, a lot of fancy things, videos, or often doing all kinds of audio stuff, testing microphones and stuff. I don't think most people out there need to be concerned with building a studio like this. No, no, you can put your 2100 on a desktop stand, not the little baby one that comes with it, but that would get you going. Yeah. Record in your closet. I, there you go. Scott Sigler. Yeah. He, when he first started doing his, uh, his first audio book, there are pictures of him with a big condenser microphone in the middle of a walk-in closet. <laughs> It worked. Here's a great question. Christopher Nessie asked, would it be easier to describe what makes a bad studio and go from there? Mm, reverb. Maybe. Yeah. Re oh boy. That's yeah. Um, a reverb, a condenser microphone, um, bad neighbors. Yeah. Noise and reverb. I think that's, those are the two <laughs> worst uh, sins for a podcaster background noise and reverb and that's the hardest stuff to try to fix and uh, the reverb is not necessarily an echo but it is it's a kind of like an echo at a microscopic level it's the sound is bouncing off everything and coming back to you at so close to the time that you said it that you can't distinguish actual words and it's mixed up so much that it just gives you this droning sound behind your voice or a slight echo sound yeah, I know um, for the longest time I was podcasting in the basement. And so that was always, there was always a laundry issue oh, yeah. because it was like, yeah, you know, no, yeah, exactly. The dryer and the washer. Um, and then I moved into a bedroom for a while and the bedroom was right next to the road. I could look out the window and there was Detroit road. And I was like, that's not going to work because it's a really busy road. And it was, you know, I could throw a rock out the window and hit the street. That was not a good thing. So, um, yeah, and what I was doing back at home in the basement level of our by level, I would turn off the air conditioner or heater whenever we were recording because I was right below a vent and it was loud enough that it made it into the recording. And that meant that everyone else in the house would suffer and whoever was in the studio then would also suffer to some degree, it, it getting either too hot, too cold, whatever. And uh, being completely separate from the house means then I don't have to make people suffer yeah the uh i wasn't podcasting i back when i had first started building websites and i had uh a newsletter i put my office in an attic that's a bad idea i mean on one hand it was great because i was completely separate from the rest of the house but in the summer oh it was ridiculous and it got to the point i've, I've always heard of this and i didn't believe it but it would actually make my computer overheat so I actually had to get an air conditioner to put it in the window of the attic, which completely defeated the purpose. And uh, that was, but you can have it so hot that the computer would just, just turn itself off, would overheat. And I'm like, well, so much for that word document. Yeah. yeah I, I'm wanting to uh, maybe eventually switch to uh, LED panels that take up a lot less space. You and I both have the big bulky CFL light mm -hmm. fixtures, which are really nice and affordable. Like I've got my kit, two soft boxes, an overhead light for about uh, $160 or $170, which for a lighting kit that puts out 3,800 watts of light, that's a killer deal. But they're also extremely cheap. You've yeah, got, yeah. what do you have? I have something cowboy. Oh yeah, the cowboy studio. Yeah, and they're fine. I just, I every, anything near my lights, I, I do not go there. That's it's like the part of the room that nobody goes there because all you got to do is go on them and they will <laughs> fall over. Yeah. That's the thing. When we say cheap, we don't mean only the price, but yeah. also the 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 build quality. But as long as you're okay uh, with uh, careful with them and maybe add some extra weight to them or don't try and move them around much, 
then you could probably be fine with them. Right? Yeah, like, I, it's it's always a weird thing for me because I need them up high to go over the monitor in some cases, depending on where they're at. And so then you make the legs wide, well, and then they're short. So if you make them tall, well, then it's also easy to fall over. So yeah, um, but yeah, I've lost a bulb or two from a. You look up in timber. <laughs> like, All right. Well, I've got four lights left. Okay. Well, I was packing up my studio at home. I had my first lights. Uh, you know what torch light is? That's the kind where the it has this like it's like a torch sort of. Mm -hmm. um, it has this bowl at the top of the stand, and the light shines up at the ceiling mostly. I had this um, torch lamp at home, and um, this unit that screws into it that splits out to four bulbs, like you'd see in a basic CFL lighting kit, and several daylight color bulbs in this. I got from a photo studio that was going out of business. And that was my lighting kit for a while, just that one thing with those bulbs. But I use it now kind of as a backup or an additional light that I put in these torch lights. Well, I was picking up the lights to move and I picked it up and just rammed it into the ceiling and shattered one of the bulbs. And then suddenly started thinking, you know, these are kind of toxic. I could kill myself staying in this room. <laughs> uh um, Chris asks in the chat room, Daniel, point them to your video. Daniel's got a lot of really good, uh, videos on lighting and kind of before and after. Um, do you have a, uh, do you know your, your quick link to that? Cause I want to know about lighting for video. And I think Daniel is locked up or in, an, he's in extreme deep yep. thought. He's back. Um, okay. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chrome and El Capitan, El Capitan is not the smoothest experience, just so you know, if you're on OS and uh, Chrome slows down a little bit. And so that's what just happened there. The audacity to podcast.com slash cheap lighting, I think was uh, one of, or actually it's just lighting was uh, one video. It's basically an unboxing video and demonstration of this lighting kit that I got as well as the audacity to podcast.com. And then uh, metal moments lighting. asked about a adjustable mm -hmm. acoustic microphone isolation, isolation shields. I've used two of these. I've tried them and taken them both back. They might make more of a difference if I was in a really huge echoey room. Uh, but for me, and I, and if I was using a condenser microphone, so I put them around a dynamic microphone thinking it would, it would block even more. And I didn't hear much of a difference. It's one of those where if you're sitting in a quiet room, you know, pushing your headphones into your head, yeah, you could see that. But to the average person driving down the road, I don't think I personally was going to hear any difference. I know there's uh, there's one I was reading about that looks like an eyeball. It's this round cylinder thing, and you stick the microphone up through the bottom of it. And even in their video, they have somebody talking in like Ray's barn, right? It's this big old echoey thing. And they put it in and it sounds a little better, but it's still pretty echoey. And I want that would still be distracting. So I think if you're in a a really hugely horrible situation, they would help. But I think if you have a dynamic mic, for me at least, I didn't find a thing. Daniel, have you ever played with any of those little things that you put around your microphone and people are putting all sorts of stuff into milk crates and then you put your mic in there and things like that? I I tried one at uh, CES. I did a little video, I think, about it um, when I had almost no voice. And yeah, I've seen the kind that curve around the microphone. And it did definitely help a lot. That kind of thing can work great uh -huh. because there is this actual, uh, I forget what it's called, some kind of phasing, I think. Um, but it's what happens when the sound bounces off your monitor back to the back of your microphone. It um, makes the echo slightly out of phase or the rear pickup slightly out of phase, which can have some technical effects on your audio. How much you'll actually hear it, I don't know. But it's one of those things that like the really geeky people like Paul Figiani, who's basically responsible for making the high PR40 popular. Um, it's things that like people like Paul obsess over because he's an expert at audio. 
Um, but the the eyeball thing that sticks over the microphone, I haven't tried it yet. I've been in touch with the con company. The one they have now is only for side address microphones, whereas most dynamic microphones are end fire microphones. So they're making one soon for um, the end fire microphones, like most of what we have. And then we can see how does it work for a dynamic mm -hmm. microphone. But I see people doing things like you'll get those uh, those little crates from wherever. And then just line it with the egg carton look uh, stuff. And that makes for a great it's, little. The good thing is the one I tried, I, I bought from Guitar Center, brought it home, took some tests, um, let it sit a day, went back the next day and listened to the examples. And I didn't hear enough of a difference to keep it. So for me, I took it back. But I think it depends on where you're at. So. Yeah. And another thing, you know, this is something very practical here for people making their own podcast studios. I mentioned this in one of my recent episodes. If you're doing a solo show, that's one thing. You might get your room conditioned for you by yourself. But once you add another microphone, you're suddenly making things more complicated. Like in my case, my co-host sits directly across from me. So his microphone is facing the opposite side of the room. That means it's a new side of the room that potentially has echo. It means my voice could be crossing over into his microphone. Now, being facing away from each other, we help reduce that. And we have a, a gate, a noise gate that helps prevent some of that crosstalk. But still, it can happen where I say something, it bounces off the walls to his microphone, but maybe not bouncing back to my microphone or vice versa. So having multiple people kind of complicates yeah, um, I've, studio uh, setup. I've run into that same situation. Because most of my stuff is either A, somebody on Skype, or it's me solo. And when I actually had a podcast with my wife, that was a new whole thing where she had to, same thing. We had to point our microphones directly apart. And then we had to get into headphone amplifiers because I'm deaf and she's not. So it was a lot of fun when you get somebody actually in the room for you. It adds a whole new dynamic. So what would be your dream studio? If you could do anything and it didn't cost you, if you're not spending your money, uh, let's say it's you and a couple other co-hosts. I've never heard, I've never had one, but I've heard sometime. so much about what RE20s and I like my RE320. So I don't know that I just read about Bob Heil today. I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and there's a whole section on Bob Heil and Heil technology. Um, but I think you kind of share this. I, I don't like the way it really alters your voice to a certain extent, but it'd be nice to 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 figure out a, a PR40, an RE320, or an RE20, and then a bunch of DBX uh, 286 preamps. That would really be it. And then um, I'm not sure what it would, just some sort of lighting to do that. And then um, some sort of DSLR camera. That would be awesome. Um, how about you? I think a space mm -hmm. a little bit bigger than this. I think my ideal space would be maybe 350 square feet. Uh, a sound, either acoustic walls or acoustic panels on the walls, a nice dark background, black <laughs> or dark gray. Uh, you know, I only work in black and sometimes very, very dark gray. Lego movie, most awesome movie ever. I've watched it, I think, seven times. But uh, something like that, so it looks really neat. And then when there's lighting, any LED lighting or something, it could look cool. I'd love to have the ability to do some LED lighting effects that maybe I could even change the colors or something. Like even if it's a, a simple like light stripe or something in the wall behind me, something neat like that, just dynamic yeah. looking. I look at people uh, like um, Andrew Todd Zarian Cochran from studio, uh, really neat. You know, the guys from Queens. Tiny space. Um, yeah, but yeah, GFQ network. Um, uh, the Minecraft me guy, I can't remember his name. Uh, it escapes me at the moment. Geekgamer.net, I think is his website or geekgamer.com. Um, there's someone else here on Blab I met at Podcast Movement. He has a great studio too. And he's doing some really nice stuff in very small space. The, right. the problem for me is I want to do a lot of things and it can't all necessarily work in the same space or it's, it's not ideal. Like I like to stand up for certain kinds of videos instead of sitting down. 
I can't do that. Or I couldn't do that before. Now I can because of this killer deal on a nice a supposedly yeah, standing desk. desk that, that would be Ikea. something else I would like to have. Cause I'm with you. I just get tired of sitting after a while. And I know it's not great for me. So I would love to be able to yeah. adjust my desk up and stand if I want or sit if I want. That would be uh and those are not cheap. No. Yeah, they're if you get a manual one, it's going to be at least $200. Uh, Woot had a killer deal on one a month ago, about 250 for a manually cranking, uh, standing, and the kind that of desk you yeah. raise and lower. But if you want an electric one, that's about $500. I got this one from Ikea that they said it was broken and uh, said motor doesn't work. We plugged nice. it in and it did work. And... $99. We bought it. No thought given to it. And then later the guy did say, Oh, by the way, I talked to the guy who actually worked on this. And he said that it seemed mm -hmm. like the motor was slowing down, but there are actually two motors in it, one for each leg. So if the motor was slowing down, then that would mean one leg would be higher than the other. I haven't seen that happen yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't plan on raising and lowering it a whole lot. It's a separate desk that I would do stuff at like shoot videos at my video that I did for how to submit your podcast to Google play store. Um, I did that from my video they, room. They make them now, door, which to me the, seems um, kind of weird where you can put desk. like a separate, almost like a shelf that raises and lowers. So you could put your computer and your monitor on it. So you have your sitting desk, which are, they're supposed to be cheaper, but by, they're still like three, 400 bucks. And I'm like, yeah, eh. now it beats, the 1200 that somebody says in the chat room here, but, um, that's, that's still to, to me, it you, you're, I'm losing some of my desk space to the stand. And I'm like, I'd rather just have a whole desk that goes up and down. And you know, I saw on, I think yeah. Amazon, this thing you can get that it's a thing you put on top of your desk. It gives you a new surface and then the entire desk surface raises and lowers, not just your monitor and keyboard, but the entire surface. So you put that on your desk, it raises your desk by an inch or so, and then you can crank it up and raise your desk to a standing desk. So it's desk. not, it's not even tall enough to sit on the floor, hmm. but it's designed to sit on awesome. top of an existing desk. Well, sure. Let's see. You want to answer some random questions we've got here? Use slash Q if you want to ask any questions. You know, I've, someone I've asked, almost pulled that trigger numerous times, mic flags? and I've yet to. I'm always. It's on my list of. You know what? I should probably get one of those. I know they're not as cheap. I know you can basically make your own. You can buy like a little plastic thing and then just get some labels and print your logo on it. Because, like with Daniel's, I mean, you've got that little square there. If you put a label on that, I'm not going to be able to tell, you know, even in HD, I doubt that I'm going to wait that. I think I see a, you know, uh, a line there. I think that's actually, a, you know, a sticker. So, cause they're like 60, 70 bucks, depending, even more than that in some cases, depending on what they're made out of. And yeah. I, yeah. I've gotten yeah. a cheap one before just that you slide onto a microphone for, I think, $15. Big mistake I made is I got black, and this yeah. one is black too. If you're planning on printing your own, don't get black. Because then when you print on white paper, the black comes through and your colors aren't, don't really pop as well. Um, but if you get your, if you get stickers made from somewhere else, like, you know what I should do? I should stick <laughs> a podcaster's round table sticker on this. And then I can just turn it when I don't want that display. I have one on my iPod. Um, those like stickers, I've probably got a podcaster's round table sticker somewhere around here, but. Oh, can you send it? I put one on the back of my Mac recently because I realized I probably shouldn't have an Apple logo visible in my videos. Whoops. There went something. Right. Yeah. There's our. It looks like Podcasters Roundtable brought to you by Apple. But um, some of the stickers that you can get, that whole tangent was to say, the stickers can sometimes work on a black background. But if you're printing something at home, yeah, I see sure uh, who background. put that in the chat or room. Double at layer. Too much massa. Like um, 
send us to onairmikeflags.com. You can get one for 30 bucks. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. Thanks for that. Ah, their setup fee. There's always a catch somewhere. I, I know that most of them are that I've that I've looked into for the square ones. They're always like 50, 60 bucks. I'm always like, that'd be cool to have next month. So they asked um yeah. uh Shifus Daddy, Shifus Daddy. Uh, was asking about, uh, you'd saw in your, your video about the RE20, but yet you're still using your high LPR 40. <laughs> That's because I don't if, own the RE20. And if you did, you would be they using loaners for review. I had to mail them back. I think I would want to use the RE320, actually. Uh, because it seems, the more I listen to those comparison videos, the, the more I think the RE320 is a more natural representation of my voice and probably more universally compatible. And yes, I like the way you sound on that microphone. And um, I think that's the one I would more generally recommend people buy if they want a nice microphone. The RE20, yeah, does need a lot of gain. I, I did this little test that um, the between the RE20, RE320, high LPR40, and ATR2100, the loudest microphone, the most sensitive microphone was the RE320. That means you don't have to turn up your gain as much, so you, you're relying less on whatever preamps you're using, thus less hiss. The quietest microphone was the RE20 of these three, and then just above that a little bit was the high LPR 40. Yeah, I've always, I just looked out. I just asked RE for one and, and bartered with the company to, to trade for it. And I've always liked the way I sound. So yeah, I've actually thought sometimes of maybe switching to the ATR 2100. There are certain things I think I sound better on that microphone, right. but yet it's a smaller dynamic range because of just the way it's designed and such. Um, I have on loan, on indefinite loan, I have a Heil PR35, which is the same, essentially the same microphone as the PR30. And a representative from Heil said she hmm. thought I might actually sound better on that microphone than the PR40. But its gain settings are completely different. So the last time I tried it, my gain was completely off and it threw my gate and compressor limiter gate off and it made the audio from that microphone very punchy uh, instead of a smoother sound. So it wasn't you know, quite it, a To me, I guess test. I was looking for you think of the BP to really be this like, like when I first heard a, a PR40, I was like, wow, I could really hear the difference over, I think at the time I was using a Shure SM58. And so I kind of was expecting that kind of wow kind of uh, reaction. And it didn't seem to have, it, it didn't sound muddy, but it didn't have like the clarity that I was kind of expecting. And kind of in the same way, it didn't boost the bottom end. So um I'll throw this in the chat room. I actually, you can hear it on that episode. It wasn't a bad microphone. It just wasn't something that was like, oh, I'm definitely dumping the RE320 now. This is this is the way I want to go. And I, I in that episode, I compared a, an Audio, Audio Technica 2100, the BP40, and the RE320, and kind of said, you know, if you have a decent microphone and you have a mixer, you can kind of make any microphone sound, you know, okay, if not better than okay. I know Daniel had a, an old episode about how to make a cheap microphone sound uh, better than than they are. So it it wasn't a bad microphone. It's a little more expensive than you know some of these other ones. So I guess that's what I was looking for. It is a great weapon. You could definitely take somebody out with this thing. It's it, it's really well made. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So. It feels like it, you know. Made out I, of rod it, it's iron not that I didn't like it. Like it that. just didn't blow me away. You know, it, it wasn't. It didn't move me enough to switch microphones. I guess. You know, as for a 
design of a microphone, shape and features and such. Yeah. The two microphones I like the best design wise are the BP40 mm -hmm. and the um, uh, SM7B. Uh, the BP40, because, well, one thing, yeah, it's built like a tank. So that microphone is going to be extremely durable, but I don't make a habit of dropping my microphones. Um, but also the BP40 has its own mm -hmm. specialized shock mount and the microphone snaps into that shock mount. So it's middle weighted instead of this sort of thing where um, the shock mount here is weighted at the, or it connects at the back. So the weight of the microphone is constantly pulling the shock mount down in the front. Well, their shock mount center weighted, really neat, modern approach, I think, to it. And I like the SM7B's approach because it has an internal shock mount and it has that nice thing where the XLR cable, the XLR plug yeah. is pointing up. So you're not ending yeah, it's, it's up a, with just this a well designed cable mic. sticking out of the back. Yeah, that was I, I'm with you. Microphone. I thought the the snapping in and out of because anytime you, yeah. I, again, not that we take our microphones in and out a whole bunch, but um, it was if I wanted to, it was nice that I could just snap it out and and go with that. And uh, yeah, somebody else asking the the chat room here an Apex Channel Master preamp. Yeah, that would be my dream studio. Um, they have the big bottom thing. It's a lot to me. The DBX 286 is kind of the the poor man's version of that. Uh, I heard that at one of the first new media expos that I went to, and it was just amazing the sound you could get out of that. Um, and really, the DBX has a lot of the same features. They just don't have, they don't call it big bottom. Um, they just call it, I think it's low. I forget the name of it exactly, but yeah, um, those things are just in seven eight hundred dollars for the preamp. They're they're great, but it's you know when I'm rich and famous, I'll definitely get one, but. That won't be anytime soon. You know, something else, uh, ideal studio equipment I wish I could afford is a mixer that has true multi-track recording capabilities mm -hmm. so that every person that's on my guest, on my podcast, is on a separate track. I was thinking of getting one with my reseller discount that I can get uh, since I'm a reseller. But then uh, my editor actually pointed out to me, well, Daniel, you're actually already doing that because you're doing double enders with your co-hosts it's only your in-studio host that is on the same track as you and there i could even split that out if i wanted to do some kind of like left right split or something yeah i'm at amazon and actually the apex they're calling it the project channel microphone i believe that's the one i'm interested in it says it has a built-in oreg cider and a big bottom which again is very similar to the the dbx 286 um and they used to be i swear they were around 700 dollars. now they're only five only 500 dollars. that's still a little crazy but that would be if i had the money i would definitely play with one of those they came up with a microphone it unfortunately was a condenser microphone that had that um those features the big bottom and the oral exciter built into the microphone you could turn them on and off i uh, played with those for a little bit but because it was a condenser it just it doesn't work for most podcasters mm. yeah unless you have a really good studio you know, yeah it all comes back full circle <laughs> if you have a great studio then you could use a condenser microphone but yeah, most I, see, don't. I see they have the the master preamplifier from apex is a thousand dollars that's just crazy but you know, another thing I'd like is a dedicated streaming computer, like a, a, a TriCaster or a Paladin or something like that. So I could move it off of my one and only computer to something else and then stream in high definition without making my computer fan go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The poor computer fan. Yeah. So it's what I've decided to do, is, and I tried this actually. This is something neat that we did with Blab. We've done a couple times. Is um, for my Once Upon a Time podcast. We're no longer doing it on Blab though, because Blab isn't compatible enough to make it friendly for our users. But um, what we tried a couple times is we tried it with Blab, where um, I was using my camera on my computer, my co-host was using his camera on his computer. But the sound was all coming through my system on my computer. So we muted the audio. His computer was picking up. So people could see him. 
They could see me. They could hear both of us. His voice, his lips would be slightly out of sync uh, because the audio was coming from me, not his computer. But it was barely noticeable, if, if at all. But the problem was the computer fans were getting so loud that it was reducing the quality of the podcast, I felt. So I, I came up with this idea of, hey, let's use our iOS devices to stream the video instead, since the Blab iOS app works great. So we both set up our iPhones facing each of us and did the exact same setup. And that was great because then it was no fan noise whatsoever. And that's what I do now with the Audacity to Podcast when I stream here on Blab, because I continue to do that show on Blab, is I use my iPhone for the streaming. The one downside is the uh, Blab software for audio input, uh, it's not processing the equalization properly mm. on the, the, the incoming audio. So I s tend to sound a little bit um, tinny if I'm on the iPhone audio as opposed to the audio through my computer. But it means a higher quality audio recording because my fan isn't running as high. Was um, the problem with Blab when, because I know when two people talk, it kind of wigs out at the same time. It doesn't know what to do with that at times. Was that the big problem with your, your show and Blab? No, um, for me, I, I like the Blab platform, but my problems for my Once Upon a Time pro podcast, um, two problems. One, not all of our followers are on Twitter or want to log in with their Twitter accounts. Mm. Two, Blab only works on Chrome and Firefox. And I'm a user experience guy. I've done website design. I'm a website designer, not for hire. And the, it, the ease of using a platform for my users is extremely important to me. So by making it that you have to use Chrome or Firefox, or if you're on iOS, you have to install the app. It doesn't work in many mobile browsers. I just thought the usability there isn't good enough. That's not acceptable. I want this to be as easy as possible for my community. And then I also realized because the chat closes now when you end the blab, my community couldn't stay and hang out after the mm. podcast. So we switched that podcast back to recording live on YouTube live, powered by Google Hangouts on air in our own chat room on my own slash live page. But the Audacity to podcast, I'll continue to do here on Blab because I think the content I'm sharing on the Audacity to podcast ha has more of an audience or a potential audience here on Blab. And that's the show I'd actually rather grow than my Once Upon a Time podcast. And like you see with um, Ask the Podcast Coach, Blab is great for the interaction and podcasting conversations have a lot of great interaction as well. So it works. And our audience is a bit more geeky. Yeah. One, have it on Blab. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We had a question here about um, podcast kits. What would you say to those buying the podcast studio in a box? So the fun part of this, <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan of there is no one size fits all. Um, I, I know I'll just call the elephant. And I, I know we all know Cliff Ravenscraft sells a package in the box. So when I say this, I'm not bashing Cliff. I, I like Cliff. I think he's a great guy. Um, very knowledgeable guy. I just don't think that's the case. I've seen people that now the good thing is with Cliff's package, you can do whatever you want. That's a very, very versatile package. Um, but in many cases, you're buying software, that, not software, hardware that you might not need. You might not need a mixer with that many inputs and things like that. So, um, And I know um, Behringer had one that actually didn't sound bad. It was this little baby Behringer mixer with a USB interface. It wasn't great. The microphone that came with it was meh. But that's my only big worry is, is I don't know. You know, it depends on if you have a co-host. Is your co-host on Skype? Um, there's all sorts of variables. So it's hard to say, here's the one package you need because everybody does things differently. So that's, that's my only worry about those. Yeah. What I see most of those podcast kits, if they're not put together by expert podcasters, yeah, uh, podcast consultants, I'll put it that way. If they're not put together by expert professional podcast consultants, then I really question the quality of the stuff in the kit because most of those kits 
seem to be packaged with condenser yeah, microphones. microphones. Yep. Or like USB only condenser microphones and headphones and software or something like that. That I just think, okay, yeah, it's, it's good, but you're forgetting where podcasters actually are. They're not understanding the audience well enough yeah. to know what are the actual needs of podcasters and such. But like you could, you could do fine with an ATR 2100. That's ba that's a basic kit in a box there. Yeah. <laughs> ATR 2100 almost. Yeah, that's that's the one I recommend. I'm like, start there, and now let's have a conversation. Tell me what else, how are you doing it, where you're recording it, how many people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. I got to talk to, this has turned into, I don't know what this has turned into, but um, I got to talk to the Hinden, Hindenburg yeah. developer. They gave me a demo of their software. Oh, I love that stuff. And yeah, it's some really cool stuff. I didn't realize... This is amazing. Only Hindenburg can do this. I don't think any of the other, even professional audio editing software can do this. Hindenburg can record multiple audio devices simultaneously. Audacity can't do that. Adobe Audition can't do that. Uh, Pro Logic or Logic Pro can't do that. Uh, I don't think any of the other programs can do that. One. Uh, but, Spreaker's new app. That's not an audio editing program. Ah, good point. Yeah, so yeah, it can do that. Uh, sure, Mix, no, Spreaker, yeah, can do that. Mixler does something differently yeah. where they can loop back the computer sound. But recording multiple devices, y yes, there are hacks around it. You can use Audio Hijack or Soundflower or right. Virtual Audio Cable or Voice Meter Banana, something like that. Um, voice Pro Meter Banana? banana voice me it's voice meter oh is, that thing yes yeah yeah and they they emailed me recently and they wanted me to look at their products and i had to ask them please clarify your products because you have so many products that seem to do the same thing yeah please tell me what's different about these and i, I don't quite understand pro tools shifa Staddy says pro tools can do that okay that's cool to know that's a little overkill though for most people but yeah. you can do it. Yeah. Uh, Lynn Jordan asks again, what mixer do you recommend with the ATR 2100? Again, depends on what you're doing. If it's just you, the little baby one with two inputs. Um, if you have four people, I used to know the model numbers. I don't anymore, but I always go for however many people I have. That's how many XLR inputs I want. At least. Yeah. And I don't mind Behringer stuff. I, I, I talked to a couple people that said the the preamps in Mixer versus um, Mackie, they didn't think there was that much of a difference. I've, it, I think Mackie stuff seems sometimes a little better built. Their knobs seem a little smoother, um, just a little higher quality, but that doesn't mean the Behringer stuff is horrible. Um, that's what I'm using right now. That's what Daniel's using. So, um, But it really depends on what you're doing. I mean, the, the Mixer I'm using right now, the only reason I have it is for a while on Saturday, I was doing two mix minuses, one to a co-host and one to a phone number, uh, plus playing um, live sound effects from my iPad. So I needed a mixer with a ton of inputs and a ton of auxiliary sends. So I have uh, the Behringer X. Eight, the same as yeah, eighteen thirty-two. Yeah, that's the same one I have. Yeah. So. Yeah, you could look at. Um... The Behringer 1204 yeah. is a great mixer for XLR inputs. The newer models have built-in compressors. It has, uh, I think, two mix uh, auxiliary outputs, like auxiliary and then FX output, maybe. I can't remember. Nice. One of them might be pre-fader, which means if you mute the channel, it doesn't mute what goes out to that channel. But um, if you're going to get a mixer, make sure it has auxiliary out. Uh, yeah. Whatever small mixer you're getting, because most likely your reason for getting a mixer is you need that kind of thing. It's interesting because you have to look at the dates on some of these because they have on Amazon, they've got the you know 1204 USB, and then later they have, but then you look at the date, there's one called the, Q, oh, that's the 1202. That's the newest. The Q1202? Q, okay. Yeah, the Q line, or actually, I think the apps, yeah, Q line is the newest. 
from the Baron. That's a deal. Four inputs for 99 bucks. Q12 or two? Yeah. And it's USB. What are your thoughts on USB mixers, Daniel? To me, I'm always like, most of the time if I'm using a mixer, if you're doing anything with a mix minus, you can't really do a mix minus with a USB, can you? Because it's... The big problem with the USB is you don't have much control over it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can bring in USB into your mixer, but you can't control uh, you can't control its volume level in your mixer. You can't control if it goes out to FX or to auxiliary or anything like that. Now on the um Yamaha Yamaha has the new AG03 and AG06. They sent me a couple to review. And their approach to USB is kind of cool. Um, you can make the USB a dry output, a mix output, or it can loop back whatever's coming into USB. It can go back out to the computer. How practical that is, I'm still experimenting with. But generally, I don't like using the USB on the mixer unless it's a true multi-channel USB. I'd much rather have Sort of. one of these things which came with the older behringer mixers yep, that's what i use on saturday yeah and, and yeah this was my ground loop noise was coming from this oh. yeah so it was actually here's the little thing if you can only get a single ground loop isolator which you can get one from best buy this is the one i got from best buy um ask in their auto department and you might have to go back to where they actually work on the cars to ask them for this but ground loop isolator from the auto department not audio auto um this worked too but i like the one from monoprice more because this is four channels whereas this is only two but if you're working with the u control most likely this needs to go on the output of the u control not the input that's what i found anyway but um, yeah, what I like about this is I can plug this into uh, the U control. I can plug it into any input or output from my mixer. And then I have full control of where my audio comes in and where it goes out. Interesting. You said that was from Mono Channel? Mono Price. Mono Price, I see. Because there's, yeah. there's nothing at monochannel.com. Yeah, mono price. It's a four-channel ground loop isolator, so it has two stereo inputs and outputs. I've got it connected to my mixer now, so I can't really show it. Right. I'll have to uh, check that out because that's driving me crazy. And it's weird because sometimes if I it has, it has something to do with the monitor because I know there are times when I. Like if I'm on monitor one and I click on something on monitor two, it gets louder. So it's like when I use that monitor, it's that's like that's a clue. I'm not sure as to what, but that's it, it, like the wider the screen gets, yes. the more it makes noise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. For me, uh, in this new studio, I was talking about this in my podcaster society webinar today. It's really spaghetti here. Um my the problem was coming from the monitor because the monitor is connected to the display port on a Thunderbolt adapter that's connected to my computer. What's also connected to that display port, uh, uh, the Thunderbolt adapter, is the USB Behringer U control device, but that's not the problem. The prob one of the problems was the antenna I have for when I watch my TV show here at the studio and then record the podcast episode. The um, converter box from the antenna. The audio line goes to the mixer. The video line goes to the monitor. That was creating a ground loop noise. So I could just unplug that whenever I'm not recording. Uh, but ground loop isolator fixed that problem. And then there were there were other things too. So my fixing things, I fixed the sound by getting the ground loop isolators. The other thing, if you go to Guitar Center, you can get a Hum X. It's by Ebb Tech. Uh, ask them to price match Amazon because it's much cheaper on Amazon or just buy it from Amazon. And you know what? Here's uh, the, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm going to try and do this more quickly than Dave Jackson can produce an affiliate link for this product. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on Amazon, it's about $51 for the Hum X. And um, it is a power plug that it doesn't 
just disconnect the ground from a line. You you really don't want to do that. There's a reason plugs have ground on them. So what this does, though, is it reduces the hum or noise from that. And I discovered that my Behringer MDX 4600 compressor limiter gate was creating some some static in the recording, very barely noticeable, but noticeable enough. And I solved this by, you're not really supposed to do it this way, but I plugged a power outlet into the Hum X mm. and plugged the mixer and the Behringer U control into that um, power strip. And that fixed a different problem for me. Excellent. Make a uh, make an affiliate link for the um, you know the the mono price. It's uh, eleven bucks on Amazon. Here, if you uh, if you throw this into Amazon, give me an affiliate link and I'll buy that. <laughs> All right. I got two of them actually because of how many inputs and outputs I have with my mixer. They're cheap. I thought there was going to be like 20 bucks. I might have one here. Uh, I'll have to double check, but yeah, and the ones from Best Buy are $15 and it's only one channel or you know, it's yeah. one stereo, you know. I will say I I wasn't sure if I was going to um uh enjoy my Prime. I have a Amazon Prime account mm -hmm. and I love the fact that there's like no sh I definitely it's paid for itself in the shipping because when you have it which is why amazon does it when you have it you order more stuff yeah. you have to so that it pays for itself it's like brilliant marketing in a way well you want to know maybe something even worse for you okay great um did you see the thing about an amazon business account no amazon well prime gives you all kinds of other benefits you know the access to the video the music the other stuff from prime the prime kindle lending library you get lots of cool features mm -hmm. with amazon prime and you get that free two-day shipping on any order above what is it 35 or 25 or 30, 29 or somewhere around there um it's 35 i think 25 or 30 anyway so you get free two-day shipping uh with 35 dollars. thanks doug um, with Amazon business account, you get free two day shipping on orders over $49. Nice. But you don't get any of those other prime features hmm. and your limit is $49 instead of $35. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. You can even do things like give other people access to your account to be able to, for, to let them place orders and set purchase orders on your stuff. And they said you get certain discounts on things, but I haven't seen it. And being a business member, you do not get access to prime deals before people, other people do, like the lightning deals. Yeah. You don't get early access to that. All right. Well, we've learned all about hums and ground loops. And Ray's going to listen back to this and go, what the heck were these guys talking about? <laughs> I'm never going to give you guys co hosting <laughs> privileges ever again. <laughs> He'll you'll see you'll we'll listen back to this and that's when the conversation went into eight million different directions and he'll put a tag at the end of it and that'll be it. So uh, I actually do need to hop off. It's coming on nine o'clock here. I got some things I got to get to. So all right, have a good night, Dave. Yeah, we'll guys see you later. Thanks for uh, hanging out, guys. And uh, if you like Blab School of Podcasting, or I'm sorry, uh, ask the podcast coach dot com slash live every Saturday at 1030. So, and Daniel's usually in the chat. So come on back. So, And everyone remember to subscribe. The whole reason we came here in the first place was to talk about podcasting studios and uh, it's sort of have an informal podcaster round table, not even actually an informal one, but make sure that you're subscribed podcasters roundtable.com. And Ray's other show is the podcasters studio.com. My other, my show, is the audacity to podcast.com. I'll put uh, my link in the chat as well. Thank you very much for joining us, guys.